Yes, all the cool things happen in San Francisco, but there is an Indianapolis tie-in to the story, which we'll get to in a minute. So um, I'm wondering, do you remember the first time you met someone from another part of the world? Someone who spoke another language, ate different food, wore different types of clothing, had different thoughts. I'm just going to give a short memory of one of my earliest childhood memories on this topic, since we're talking about the theme of world community today. So I was five years old when my parents participated in a host family program through our church. People from different parts of the world who were visiting Ohio and wanted a place to meet a few locals and have dinner could visit and have a mini cultural exchange. One of our one of them was a visitor from Japan, a physician by the name of Dr. Kashi. I was fascinated by our guest who didn't look or talk like anyone I knew. He told me his name meant hip bone in Japanese. <laughs> then he gave me a quick lesson in anatomy, naming the various bones in the body in English and in Japanese. After dinner, he drew Japanese characters for us with a small paintbrush. I was amazed. This was not your everyday house guest. Not that we had a lot of house guests. A few years later, my family went to the World's Fair in Montreal, where my grandparents lived. This was part of a summer vacation and family reunion for us. The fair was called Expo 67. You went there too? Okay. So you, for those of you doing the math, that makes me old. <laughs> To this day, I remember walking down the concourse and seeing the different flags and languages and food and people and dress. Two official languages were English and French, and many exhibits included handsets that you could pick up and listen for more information on the display in front of you. The black phones were in English and the white phones were in French. Funny the things you remember. At one exhibit where I was standing, a woman approached and picked up a white phone. Trying to be helpful, I told her, that's a French phone. <laughs> she smiled and put the phone to her ear and continued listening to it. And then slowly, it dawned on me, this woman speaks French. And she's standing right next to me. She's different. It kind of blew my mind, my little eight-year-old mind. I grew up in a pretty homogenous community in a suburb of Cleveland, and everybody in my world spoke the same language. We all pretty much ate the same food. We spoke, we dressed alike with school uniforms. Our community was pretty much the neighborhood and the boundaries of our school district. For me and many of my friends, that was our entire world. But the world, as I grew to learn from more education and travel, is not just one neighborhood or even one town. It takes a complete human family across seven continents, many ethnic groups, thousands of languages. It has lots of thoughts. The world community is a big and difficult and sometimes confusing place. And the UU's sixth principle, I would argue, is the largest and most difficult and most confusing of our seven principles. It's just 12 words long, but it encompasses all of humanity. And it states, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. You may have seen it on our little color-coded seven principles that are at the visitor's desk, or this one's on my fridge, or was. And uh, they're coded uh, in Roy G. Biv. And the sixth principle is the indigo. It's one that I usually skip over when I'm reading them. And I doubt many people could recite it. It's not one of the big ones. It's not one of the ones we talk about a couple times a year in services. But I, I say it's the biggest one of all in many ways. It's telling us to go big to everyone, everywhere, 
But what does that mean? Is it doable? I mean, peace, liberty, and justice for all? You can sometimes barely pull off a congregational meeting without hours of discussion and arguing. Who are we to bring peace, liberty, and justice to the whole world? As the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison said in a recent sermon, the sixth principle seems extravagant in its hopelessness. Oh, excuse me, in its hopefulness. <laughs> and improbable in prospects. Can we continue to say we want world community? The world is full of genocide, abuse, terror, and war. What have we gotten ourselves into? You, you ministers sometimes call the sixth principle the Superman principle. And thanks to Jill, we now have some background music for that. <laughs> How are we supposed to make it happen? Are we Superman? No, we're definitely not Superman. Ask any UU how it feels just to hold a committee meeting with more than two agenda items. And you definitely realize you're not going to leap tall buildings. You're lucky to get an agreement on anything some days. But the principles are not meant to be achieved quickly or easily. They are our North Star, a path we follow to live an ethical life. All we can do is try and follow in the right direction. After all, the very first words of the sixth principle are the goal of world community. It's a goal. It's something you follow, not something you can attain. So tomorrow, if you didn't know it, is United Nations Day. It's the 77th anniversary of the adoption of the charter that you heard Beth read a few minutes ago. To celebrate the right word, actually, in the past few years, the world has witnessed one upheaval after another, from the rise of a global authoritarianism, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the continued climate crisis, and attacks on democracy in the US and elsewhere. In the face of that, is the United Nations or any organization able to make a difference? As Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, our denomination's president, recently said, we are living in tumultuous and dangerous times. So much is on the line. The United Nations Charter that began with the preamble that Beth read a few minutes ago, when you were listening to it, did any of the phrases pop out at you? I did a double take the first time I read this preamble a few weeks ago. The dignity and worth of the human person. Does that sound familiar? Maybe just a slight resemblance to our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Or how about this phrase, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. That sure sounds like our sixth principle. In fact, if you read some of the other UN documents, such as the famous Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the UN in 1948, you will see lots of these same phrases that sound pretty UU. The inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. Freedom, justice, and peace in the world. The right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. To me, this sounds like a UU wish list. In fact, if you look closely enough, it's more than that. And that's because both the Unitarians and the Universalists were very active in both the League of Nations and the creation of the United Nations. And I'd like to take a, a minute or two to honor a few of them. And I might be missing a page. <laughs> I found my page. So let's start with a woman named Elvira Fradkin. She was a Unitarian from New Jersey and a longtime activist for peace, disarmament, and women's rights. She was the author of 
a book called Chemical Warfare, Its Possibilities and Probabilities, published in 1929 by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. After World War II, she committed herself to supporting the United Nations. In 1946, the American Unitarian Association appointed her as a delegate to the UN, then as now religious groups and other non-governmental governmental organizations could get credentialed to attend UN meetings as observers. From 1947 to 1970, she represented the International Association for Liberal Christianity and Religious Freedom among the NGOs of the UN. And she's a leader of the New Jersey branch of the American Association for the United Nations. So from the very beginning, Unitarians had a place at the table at the UN and were deeply invested in its success. When Elvira Fradkin died in 1972 at the age of 82, the New York Times called her a leader in local and national organizations for peace, disarmament, and women's rights. Unfortunately, the headline of the obituary completely dropped the ball, identifying her as Mrs. Leon Fradkin. <laughs> Leon Fradkin, of course, was her late husband, who, as we learned in the first par paragraph, was a dentist which apparently was more newsworthy than the fact that she had a master's degree from Columbia University, was the author of three books and had a front row seat at the UN for 23 years, all of which were lower in the obituary. In, 19, in the 1950s, the Unitarian Association adopted resolutions in support of the UN. And in 1956, the Universalists and Unitarians convened the first annual UN seminar at the church center when the two denominations merged in 1961 as the UUA, they formed an advisory committee on the United Nations. They were there every step of the way. They were invested in world community. This was years before the first principle or the sixth principle were even adopted. The new denomination actually published its principles in 1961 when the two denominations merged. And they were a bit different than the ones we know today. For example, a fourth principle was stated, to implement our vision of one world by striving for world community founded on ideals of brotherhood, justice, and peace. And the sixth principle, to encourage cooperation with men of goodwill in every land. So a couple of things. Did you pick up on some of the non-inclusive language again? A brotherhood, men of goodwill, mankind, the dignity of man. That kind of language wouldn't be fixed for a couple more decades. And the other thing, those two original principles would be merged into one principle when they were revised again in 1985 and came out as a new Superman principle. The one we know today is the sixth. So as I mentioned before, tomorrow is the United Nations Day. And full disclosure, I didn't know this until a couple of months ago when Jamie asked me if I was interested in giving a sermon this year. And I looked at my calendar trying to push it out as far as I could to the end of the year and saw United Nations Day in late October, right between National Bosses Day and Halloween. I couldn't think of any sermons for those two, but UN Day sounded promising and fairly UU. Little did I know until I began reading the history. Let's honor another Unitarian who was involved. In the early 60s, a man named Ed Lye Stevenson, former governor of Illinois who had run for president twice, was named UN, UN ambassador by President Kennedy. He served for four years, most memorably during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 when he faced down the Soviet ambassador during a speech in the UN Security Council on live television and demanded to know whether the Soviet Union had placed medium and intermediate range missiles in Cuba, just 90 miles off the US border. The Soviet ambassador pretended he didn't understand the question and squirmed in his seat. He finally told Stevenson he would get his answer in due course, to which Stevenson famously responded, I am prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that is your decision. I am also prepared to present the evidence in this room. President Kennedy, who was watching the live broadcast like millions of others 
said, wow, I didn't know Adlai had it in him. Historians say that Stevenson's remarks and photographic evidence spurred the negotiations that ended the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Washington Post wrote a story a few years later with the headline, The Day Adlai Stevenson Showed Him at the UN. So who says Unitarians have to be just about hugs and kisses? Sometimes when you need to stand firm, even when you're in the center of the world community trying to bring peace, liberty, and justice for all. In the early 60s, Adlai Stevenson wrote to Reverend Dana Greeley, the first president of the new UUA. In his letter, Stevenson said, in this disastrous and shrinking world, it is no longer possible, if it ever was, for local communities to be more secure than the surrounding world. Our ultimate security, therefore, lies in making the world more and more into a community. He urged the UUA to get more involved in the social work of the UN. That resulted in the UUA setting up a plaza at UN Pla an office at UN Plaza, a global perch that allowed it to, over the decades, take a stand on issues from human rights to climate change and which is still operating today. So I talked about Elvira Fradkin and Edlai Stevenson, and now I just want to talk about one more Unitarian who did his bit in building the world community. Linus Pauling was an American chemist and one of the founders in the fields of quantum chemistry and molecular biology who published hundreds of scientific papers and won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1954. But he was also a member of the Los Angeles Unitarian Church and a peace activist who opposed nuclear weapons and arms buildups. In the 1950s, he joined with Albert Einstein, Bertrand Russell, and eight other leading scientists in citing, signing a manifesto highlighting the dangers of nuclear weapons and calling for world leaders to seek peaceful resolutions. In 1958, he presented a petition to UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld calling for an end to the testing of nuclear weapons. It was signed by 11,000 scientists representing 50 countries. For years, he took center stage debating public officials and leading rallies against nuclear weapons and supporting test bans. For all this activism, he got in a little hot water and was ordered to appear before the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee which called him the number one scientific name in virtually every major activity of the communist peace offensive in this country. So you can see sometimes Unitarians are held up for shouting down Soviet leaders. Sometimes they are held up as communist dupes, often by the same people. Pauling developed close relationships with several Unitarian peace activists, including his, in his congregation, and he once wrote, my wife and I joined the Los Angeles Unitarian Church because it accepts as members people who believe in trying to make the world a better place. And in 1962, Pauling was recognized for his work by winning the Nobel Peace Prize for his fight against the nuclear arms race between the East and the West. It was his second Nobel Prize, making him the only person to win two unshared Nobel Prizes. It was undoubtedly a credit to his scholarship, his peace activism, his courage, and I would like to think his grounding as a UU. And that was just one year after Dag Hammarskjöld won a Nobel Peace Prize for developing the UN into an international organization capable of giving life to the principles and aims expressed in the UN Charter. And as long as we're on the subject, let me just quickly point out that UN leaders are programs have won a total of 12 Nobel Peace Prizes, including twice for the UN Commissioner for Refugees and most recently in 2020 for the UN's World Food Program. So with all these prizes in recognition, you might think that the UN is firing on all cylinders, ending all wars, poverty and injustice. Well, there are plenty of critics who will quickly and accurately point out that the UN is far from perfect. It has been unable to stop conflicts breaking out all over the world, from Syria to Sudan to Ukraine. And it has been accused of mostly looking out for the interests of large founding members who won World War II and now control its Security Council. 
that has been shaken by allegations of corruption and heavy bureaucracy. And of course, now we talk about the Indianapolis connection. There's always an Indianapolis connection. The John Birch Society. An ultra-conservative political advocacy group founded in India in 1958 was an early opponent of the UN. It's 1959. Get the U.S. out of the UN campaign accused the UN of trying to establish a one-world socialist government that would undermine U.S. sovereignty. The John Birchers also alleged that communists and UN supporters were conducting an assault on Christmas to destroy all religious beliefs and customs. And this was 40 years before Fox News. <laughs> Yet the report card on the UN on balance has been positive, I would say. A RAND Corporation report found the UN to be successful in two out of three peacekeeping efforts. And the Human Security Report, produced by the University of British Columbia, documented a decline in the number of wars, genocides, and human rights abuses since the end of the Cold War, and presented evidence that international activism, mostly spearheaded by the UN, has been the main cause of decline in armed conflict in the last 40 years. Do people expect too much out of the UN and too much out of the sixth principle? Gillen Sorensen, a lifelong UU and former UN assistant Secretary General for External Relations recently said the UN is an expression of idealism tempered with realism. I would say that's pretty much the seven principles from top to bottom. An expression of idealism tempered with realism. The UN the UU principles and the inherent worth and dignity of people, of justice, equity, and compassion and human relations the goal of world community, the interdependent web of life, and all the others call us to try to make a difference in the world. Our faith urges us to step forward and do what we can, sometimes a little difference, sometimes a Superman difference. We can't all be Elvira Fradkin or Edlai Stevenson or Linus Pauling or many of the dozens and even hundreds of other yous who have done so much in their little bits, way large and small, to help build a world community. But we can do, each of us, our little bit, one step at a time. Thank you.